Welcome everyone. We're so excited for today's inside look with the Interla International League of Conservation Photographers. We've got Brooke and Colin here, and this is going to be such a great conversation about their work and then how they organize all of the amazing photography that their team manages. Um, in case you don't know already, um, Photo Shelter helps creative teams unlock the power of their visual media easily, instantly, and without compromises. I'm Kristen Twyford. I handle content here, and I'm joined by Yoav Gutman, um, who also works on our marketing team, and we are your co-hosts for this webinar. I wanted to let you know about a couple of upcoming webinars that we have before we get started with today's webinar. Um, we have a product, you know, what's new with Photo Shelter webinar coming up on October 9th at 2 p.m. ET. We're going to be talking about workspaces, our new collaboration tool, some new integrations with Photo Shelter, so our new WordPress integration, and then integrations with some storage platforms like uh, Drive and Dropbox, um, as well as AI tagging, so artificial intelligence, um, auto tagging all of your images, which is super helpful. This is some game-changing technology, and we're really excited uh, to share it with all of you. We also have a webinar coming up on October 15th, also at 2 p.m. ET, and this one is with the team from Texas A&M. So you're going to be hearing from their photographer and their social media team, um, and they're going to be sharing a little bit about their visual content strategy, their social media strategy, um, and should be a really fun, interesting conversation. And save the date for November 19th. We've got something very exciting cooking for November 19th. We don't want to give it all away just yet. So be on the lookout if you're on our list. Um, you'll, you'll get updates about that. And you'll also get updates if you're in our Slack channel. And you'll definitely want to join that today. So we've got the link right here um, to ask questions of our two guests and to meet everybody else who's here on the call today. So um, you can head over to that link and join the conversation now. Um, and you can also ask questions in the questions box as we go along for us to ask Brooke and Colin at the end. So without further ado, I want to hand it off to Brooke and Colin. Thank you both so much for being here. This is going to be a great conversation, and I'm really excited for everybody to learn more about your work. Yes, thank you both for having us. I'm so excited to be here. Let me just get this going. There we go. Um, I'm so excited to be here. It's going to be really fun. Um, Colin and I are going to talk to you about our storytelling methods and our image library and how Photo Shelter really helps us tackle some problems that we face every day in our job and in our roles. So I'm just going to start off and just give a little background on um, who we are. So we are called the International League of Conservation Photographers, which I know is quite a mouthful to say. So we typically call ourselves ILCP. Um, we have four staff members, two of us are here with you today, um, but we have 120 members, we call them our fellows, all over the world. So we're a global fellowship of the world's best conservation photographers and filmmakers. So um, these people are professional photographers and filmmakers who have excuse me, dedicated their lives to sharing stories and really spreading different information about conservation, um, animals, natural history stories, environmental justice. There are so many of them and they focus on different topics, but they all have conservation as a main focus. So our mission statement is supporting environmental and cultural conservation through ethical photography and filmmaking. So I always really highlight this ethical because, or this ethical piece of our mission statement because it is so critical to what we do. I know it's really important to us on the staff and to the members um, all over the world. And basically what we mean by ethical or putting ethics in our mission statement is making sure that the subject's well-being is of the utmost importance in all the storytelling and all the work we do. So we never want to put our subject at risk. We never want to make them uncomfortable. So that could be anything from a plant, animal, human, landscape, anything like that. Um, we, as I mentioned, we are really dedicated to conservation. And so ethics is and making sure that we're not putting anything at harm is really important to us. Um, I'm not gonna get into that too much more today, but I'm always remiss if I don't mention it whenever I can. Um, and I'm always happy to answer questions about it. And we also have a ton of information about that on our website. So feel free to go check that out. So we have a bunch of photographers. As I mentioned, we have 120 
around the world, uh, a little more than 120 now. But so we have some really big names. Christina Minnemeyer is one you might have heard of. She was our founding executive director, and she is still a fellow. Um, and she does some really incredible work. Here's a stunning image of hers that I love. We have Joel Sartor. He's a great Nat Geo photographer. He also is known for the photo work, where he's trying to document every species that human has that we as humans have in captivity, I believe. So he goes to zoos and different sanctuaries all around the world and takes these stunning photos. We have Franz Lanting, who is just a really incredible photographer. I love this iconic image of his. Brian Scary, who's a really fantastic underwater photographer. Steve Winner, he does a lot with big cats. Um, he recently did some coverage on captive tigers in the US. Um, and he has a lot of information kind of going off Tiger King. Um, but he went and met everyone. So he was not on the Netflix documentary team, but he did some photography and journalistic uh, work on that. And it recently came out in National Geographic. So I could gush about our members <laughs> all day. Um, but those are just some big ones and some of their really iconic or stunning photos. I just always love to show. Um, but let's get down to what ILCP does. So we do image-based storytelling. So as I mentioned, our photographers use photography and filmmaking um, to share stories to help move the needle and make conservation change. So that I think we all kind of know, especially in today's age of internet, that we are such visual people. Um, photos and film is really a great way to get people's attention and we just really react to that in a different way than we do, you know, data or long written text. Um, that's not to say that the data and the text are not important, but as a way to grab people's attention and talk about issues, visuals is just, it really can't be beat. Um, and the storytelling aspect, I mean, we've always responded to stories back from legends and cave paintings all the way up to today with you know, binge watching reality TV um, or anything like that. We are just a really story driven group um, as a society. So I always kind of call our members, um, you know, storytelling superheroes because they're really harnessing this power of visuals and storytelling and using it, using their power for good as a superhero would. So they're, they're making conservation change through this different image based storytelling. So that could be a single image. Like this one right here, this is a photo by Joel Sartor, and I think you would all agree it's a pretty powerful image just on its own. It tells a really strong story just in a single image, but it could also be through um, a series of images, maybe a photo essay like this one, which is by Morgan Trimmel in South Africa about Cape, Down, Cape Town's threatened plants, um, or it could be through a film. So we do, we have some photographers who make full length documentaries, short documentaries, um, I'm not going to show it all today because I'm sure you all know that <laughs> webinars and online platforms are not the best for video, but just as a sample, here's just a fun little clip. It's just the smoke running by. Um, but that's all just to say, everything we do is centered around this image-based storytelling, visuals first, um, regardless of what the visuals are, that is kind of how we do our work and where it, it all drives from. So that leads me right into how I do my work and how that relates to my role. My role is the development and communications manager. So I kind of have these two sides of development and communication and they interlock, but they're also a little, a little different from one another. And I'll get into the nitty gritty of that in just a minute. But um, in both sides of this role, just like as I was saying with our organization, images are at the forefront of what we do. So for me, that could be through partnership pitches, social media, um, you know, different events, things like that. Everything we do kind of revolves around this visual storytelling ethos of ours. Um, and just a side fun fact about this photo, because I just think it's so fun. Um, that is me in the water. Um, I'm in Puerto Rico with one of our photographers, Shane Gross, um, in February of 2020. It was the last travel we had on the books before COVID. Um, and he was photographing bioluminescence and trying to do it in this way, which you can see he was successful and this is the first time an image has been made like that and I just think that just kind of shows how our photographers are willing to try new things push boundaries and really create this stunning imagery because I think this is such an incredible photo not because I'm in it you can't see my face <laughs> um 
but just because it's just really a breathtaking scene. But back to my role. So on the development side, for my case, that's kind of a large or a broad term. So it is fundraising through grants or um, different partners or individual like kind of crowdsourcing types, but it's also developing new or continued partnerships, um, planning expeditions, uh, planning conservation campaigns, working on events, setting those ethical standards, like I mentioned, pretty much anything that moves our organization towards our mission and grows our organization in any way. It could be growing in a new capacity or continuing to grow in an area we've already done a lot in. Um, but pretty much anything under that scope, which I know is very broad, but as I mentioned, we're a very small team, so we have pretty broad scopes in our roles. Um, that's kind of where the development side of my role falls. So here are a couple of images made from different development work that we've done as a team. So this image was made by Jason Houston in La Pampa, Peru. Uh, we funded him to go on this and cover the illegal gold mining there and the environmental impacts of that. We have this image, which is of an Arctic loon, um, which is a bird in the Arctic right around the Arctic Circle in Alaska. And I'm gonna talk a lot about that project, but in a little bit, but it was an ILCP expedition or a series of expeditions. And then we have this young woman. Oh, I'm sorry, the last photo is taken by Peter Mather. And this photo is taken by Benjamin Drummond um, of this young woman. And this was a partnership that we created and the partner wanted to showcase some of their work as particularly working on making the outdoors more accessible so we had a photographer, Benjamin Drummond, go and photograph this wilderness training event. So just a couple of images that came from different types of development partnerships we worked on. So on the communications and outreach side, I think that's a little bit more self-explanatory of how images are really at the forefront of those um, because we're doing newsletters, social media, um, mobile storytelling, public outreach, anything like that. So obviously, especially in social media or things like that, images are just what get, grab people's attention, just like I was saying earlier. Um, but it could be an infographic like this that's gonna go out um, to talk about one of our expeditions and that'll go through all of our channels. Um, it could be, oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button. There we go. It could be um, an Instagram Live or some sort of mobile storytelling like you see on the left. Um, this on the right is our newsletter so that, um, we use a lot of images in that, regardless of what we're doing in terms of communication, just like with everything else, we just really push our images forward. And for me in this role, it's actually fairly easy because the images are just so stunning and breathtaking. And we have such incredible photography that I just kind of pick the image that speaks to me the most or that I think is really emotive or tells the story I think we're trying to tell. Um, and that, the fact that we have such great photographers does really make that part of my job a little easier. Um, so this kind of leads me into how Photo Shelter helps me within my role of ILCP. Um, Colin in a minute is going to talk about the, the visual library itself, but within my role, um, I am working with so many partners and I'm getting our photos out in front of all of our audiences that it's really important that I understand that each of the programs and each of the expeditions and things like that come with different image needs and therefore different image rights and usages. So something else that we do is really stand up for the photographer's rights. Um, I think, again, probably many of you know this, but with the rise of smartphones and we all are walking around with these amazing cameras in our pockets, images are constantly being undervalued. We get requests all the time for free photographs and things like that. And yes, you can make an amazing photo on your iPhone, but that is not the same as someone dedicating their lives to learning about a topic, really getting to become an expert, getting the access, you know, learning the technical skills. I could go on and on. <laughs> um, I won't, but I could. Um, it's not the same thing as a professional photographer or filmmaker. And so we really try to stand up for the value the value of the photography and respecting the photographer as a professional and that this is their career. So that's all just to say that I really make sure when I'm sending out photos or working with partners with photographs, I have to be very careful that we're, use, we're within our rights and usages because 
that's kind of one of the big things we stand for as an organization. So I log into Photo Shelter and this is what I see, these four main categories. And then if I go into each of them, they have way more in it, but Colin's done a really great job of organizing it over these broad categories. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I really focus on this internal use. So internal organization. So I click on internal use, which was what you saw in the last one the one with the purple flowers. And it kind of opens to every year starting in 2007, which was not the year we were founded, but it is very early on in our organization. Um, and it lists all the expeditions and the exhibits and everything. And if I click on one of the years, like 2019, for example, it will show me all the expeditions that happened that year or all the projects that happened that year. And then the naming system is also pretty important for me as a staff member. So Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which is the first one with the horse, that is the project name first, which means it was an ILCP expedition that we sent a photographer on. So that's a different use and rights than the two, the next two, which are Jason Houston and Morgan Trimmel, which have the photographer's name first, which means that was their project that we helped fund. I don't need to get into like super nitty gritty of all the, what that means, but even our naming system indicates to me that there is a different usage. Um, and then I can, I'm usually pretty knowledgeable at this point because I've been at the organization for almost three years about what those usages are, but I can always reference the, the actual agreements that were signed because they lay it out really clearly. Um, and I should mention that this was a, since we are such a small team and we have such small resources, this was a huge help with how Photo Shelter was organized and how Colin has organized, even when we were all in the office together because um, it just saved myself time. It saved Colin time. I didn't have to ask him every time I pulled an image. As I mentioned, images are at the forefront of what we do. So I'm constantly pulling images. So if I had to check with him every time, I mean, I think he would be very annoyed with me as a coworker. Um, but this has become even more important and valuable to us since we are working remotely. And I would have to wait for him to respond to an email and he'd have to read all my email requests and things. So this has just been a really, Photo Shelter has done a great job of helping us and it's just been such a delight to be able to work like this um, because working remotely with our limited time and resources, um, if it, we didn't have this type of organization and very clear method, it would be really difficult for us. Um, so something else that I do a lot is I need to get images and metadata quickly. So I need to go in and find the image and pull the metadata um, because we don't always know when a conservation issue is going to come up and we want to be able to respond really quickly. So for example, in 2017, um, the Trump administration opened the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is this what you're looking at, or as this is part of it, um, which is in Alaska. They opened it up for drilling. This has been a conversation for a long time, but they were starting to move forward with some of these political I don't know the term, but basically the things that were keeping it politically from being open to drilling, they were starting to break down. Um, and this would be terrible. I mean, it's a refuge, so it's an incredibly important area um, to just so many people, including, so this is what the oil drilling would look like. This is not in the refuge, but very nearby. I think it's right outside Prudhoe Bay um, in Alaska. It's really important to this like beautiful landscape. I mean, this would destroy that. Um, really important to the caribou. They are these really important species. Um, and this specific area that they're talking about drilling is their birthing ground. They migrate there every year and they give birth. Um, there's a ton of other animals. You see this bear. We all were just talking earlier about how much we love bears. Um, they really rely on this land as well. The First Nation, which in people, they rely not only on the landscape, but also on the caribou and the other animals. So it's just a really, really important territory to keep um, conserved. So in 2018, right after this announcement was made in November of 2017, we sent 40 photographers, writers, filmmakers, and artists into the refuge to do eight expeditions to cover the importance of this area. And it was a really grueling and a really intense trip, but I mean, they did a really fantastic job. We came up with articles and written pieces and photo stories and two films and I mean it was just amazing what they came back with I mean really grueling though <laughs> um 
but it was we were able to get it covered in so many places. You see it on the cover of Audubon here, National Geographic Newsroom, New York Times, countless film festivals. Um, so this is really a major project we've been working on. So in the past, I, I think the past month, maybe the past two months, they've been moving forward with these um, these plans for drilling. They People have been saying no to it, but they're continuing to move forward. So when this happened, I got emails and calls and texts from board members, conservationists, our partners, tons of people saying, this has happened. We need to kind of retouch on this project and talk about how this is so important and what we can do to take action. And so I had to really quickly, this was, I probably got this news eight or nine in the morning and they wanted out, you know, by noon, um, if not earlier. Um, so I was able to go in and click on 2018, like I showed you on the internal organization, click on the Project National Wildlife Refuge project, scroll through, find an image that I found really compelling. I think this is just a stunning image by Nathaniel Wilder and pull, you can see on the right hand side, there's a really, really just, um, really detailed caption. Sorry, I just really forgot the word there. Um, and tons of keywords. And the keywords are great for me as a social media manager to, I just use them as hashtags. It's so easy. So that is an instance where time is really of the essence. I was working really quickly. All of our partners were working really quickly. Um, we wanted to get this out as soon as possible. And Photo Shelter just really lent itself to, you know, we didn't have any issues with just ease. We were able to just turn around and get this going. So that's kind of a broad overview of my role at the organization, how I use visuals to share those stories and get out with partners and grow as an organization um, and how photo shelter really helps me with that um, and with that i'm going to hand this off to colin to talk about some of his work hello everyone i'm colin wheeler i am the visual assets manager essentially i manage the physical collection i'm the photo editor i'm the exhibition manager and i manage the application cycle for for new fellows um so i have a broad hat like duty hat like like brooke does um like we all do in this organization um next slide please so i'm gonna start out by giving a brief history on the visuals library um, ilcp started using photo shelter as our visual asset management program in 2010 um, and this was before we even started licensing our work we used it as essentially a, way, a place to house and organize our assets so we've used them for a very long time we've loved every everything that photo shelter has given us all the capabilities um, and licensable image collection officially started in 2014 um, that's when the photographers gave us submissions of images that they wanted us to put out into the world and have licensors like photo editors for publications, et cetera, come to us for their ethical conservation photography. Um, in 2015, we began accepting videographers to the, to the organization. Um, and this year, we actually just started our partnership with Photo Shelter for Brands. Um, and it's been amazing so far. Um, the reason we wanted to upgrade from Photo Shelter for Photographers to Photo Shelter for Brands is because we also, of course, have video assets. And prior to Photo Shelter for Brands, um, we had to separate our image assets and our video assets. Um, we housed our video assets in a separate Vimeo account. So it was pretty inefficient and confusing and people often didn't even know that we licensed video work, which is bad for organ an organization with videographers. So we are very happy that Photo Shelter for Brands gives us that op that ability to store and deliver our video assets. It's been huge for us. Next slide, please.
Um, I wanted to share this one image because it's one of our most striking images in our licensable image galleries. It's by Steve Winter. Um, and you can see how that tiger has no really, I, no clue that there's a photographer near. And that's because it was taken with a motion automated camera trap, which are really incredible pieces of, uh, of equipment. And I just thought this image is so beautiful and it's been used very frequently um, for conservation of tigers. So this is one of my favorites that I wanted to share with you all. Next slide, please. So Photo Shelter allows IOCP to do many things, but um, we are able to store our assets. And as I said before, we are now able to store our image assets and our video assets in one easy to use efficient program, which like when, when we were talking about getting this, I was so excited to finally have one program to have all of these amazing assets. So it's easier for the clients, it's easier for us. Um, it's, it really will help conservation issues to be that much more um, viewed now that we have this so easily seen and usable. Um, and Photo Shelter also allows us to send assets easily with the great quick send option for any image requests where we have one image um, where we can send um, so it's quick and, and really easy to do. And then if we, if the client is licensing multiple images, um, then we create password protected galleries or light boxes to send for them with download permissions. Um, so that's really easy to use and it looks good on the client's end, very professional, very clean um, and easy to figure out for the licensors what they need to do. Um, and we also love the capability that Photo Shelter allows um, a internal FTP server for our photographers to log on and send the us images for any submissions for um, just general licensing or for expeditions. Um, so it goes straight to me. They don't have to use Dropbox. They don't have to use WeTransfer. They just send it to us and it drops right into the gallery that um, we want it to be. And uh, we, through all of this and through these capabilities that Photo Shelter gives us, we are even more so able to promote and spread this, the important work of our fellows and to advance conservation causes around the world. So we are very happy with this um, partnership. So thank you guys. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we organize our visual assets, but mostly on the publicly viewable side as Brooke talked more about the internal side. Um, so we categorize them by featured collections, images available for licensing, and visuals from our expeditions. Um, these are pretty all self-explanatory. Um, featured collections is a fairly new capability for our fellows to take advantage of, and that'll be the next slide, Brooke. So um, featured collections is essentially a way for ILCP to license exclusively a fellow's work. So this example is of Krista Schleyer's work, who's a senior fellow for us. And um, she covers anything from the border walls in Mexico in the US to urban freshwater, um, mainly in the Maryland, DC, Virginia area. Um, so she covers it all and we organize within that featured collection of her collection based on themes that she works on. So these will all be different for all featured photographers um, based on what they cover. Next slide, please. And uh, the next groupings that we have in organization for the image assets is 
are the images from our expeditions that Brooke spoke about. Um, all images and videos are either going to be in the images from our expeditions, main folder, or videos from our exped expeditions. And those are obviously based on um, which type of asset they are. And then within those, they are organized by place of where the expedition takes place and then the year of when that expedition was. Next slide, please. And for images available for licensing, um, these are just any submissions that our fellows will send to us that they want us to license. It doesn't have to deal with any kind of ILCP program or expedition. These are images that they've done on their own or with a conservation partner um, that they want us to help license and promote. Um, and these are organized by different themes. So featured topics are timely um, issues like, such as the wildfires. Um, the image right there is from the, the red tide. Um, so those are a good and quick way for media to find images related to a timely conservation issue. Um, and then the rest, as you can see, are endangered species, cultures, places, flora, fauna, pollution, oil spills, deforestation, the list goes on. But we really want to make it easy for the, the potential um, licensing clients to find the work they need to uh, maximize their projects, um, whatever they will do to help move the needle for that cause. Next slide, please. So this is our public facing website. Um, when you go to ilcp.photoshelter.com, this shows up. Um, it's so wonderful to use. It's very customizable, as you can see here, which we liked. Um, and we were really appreciative of the fact that in that top menu where you see galleries, light boxes, contact, um, we were able to add these buttons in the menu um, that connects you to our visual usage form for anyone who wants to license our work, because you need to fill that out. Um, and then I will look at that review it, and then I will either um, accept it or reject it, depending on if it is used to advance the cause or not, and not too commercial. Um, and then when I approve it, I will, um, write, I will fill out a image licensing agreement, and along with a quote um, for the price of the licensing fee, send that to the licensor, um, they fill it out um, and sign it, send it back to me, and then I will send them the image via either QuickSend or a Lightbox, um, which is very great delivery methods um, that Photo Shelter allows for. Um, and then image services on that top menu bar um, gives you even more information on the ethics behind our photography and videography. Um, it talks about, it gives the, the pricing, it gives um, information that will let you know that if you license through our image collection, that I, I am then your personal image researcher. So you can ask me to, okay, like I need images for so-and-so, like I am then happy to look for those image for you and um, facilitate the process a little bit easier. Um, next slide, please. And here's some examples of um, what those external links look like. You can see in the top left, that's our image license request form. It's fairly simple. Um, we just want to know what it is going to be used for, the duration, what organization you work for, just anything that I need to know to make sure that these assets are used in a way that um, our mission statement complements it. Um, and then you can see in the top, I mean the bottom uh, screenshot, that's a little example of our image services page where we 
um, explain exactly how it works licensing through us. Um, it's a lot of great information on that page. Next slide. And with that, that's all in my presentation. So um, if we have any questions, now would be the time. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. We are so proud to work with you and it's amazing to see these incredible photos and um, you know how you guys make all of this happen. So thank you so much for sharing. We do have some questions. Um, a first one from Victoria looks like, how are you collecting the information on that request for license form? Is that part of Photo Shelter or are you linking out to something? We're linking out to something. Um, it would be great if that could be a part of um, our photo shelter experience. We'll um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but for now, it's linking externally to our own website's form for licensing. Cool. And what's the process after that? So once they fill out the usage form, I review it, accept or reject it. And once it's accepted, I fill out a agreement form um, based on that usage and um, the organization requesting. And in that agreement, we also have a quote um, based on our image licensing pricing structure. Um, and we send that to the licensor, they sign it. And then once they sign it, they will send us payment and we send them the imagery or videos. So it's it's pretty it's pretty simple licensing through us, but we definitely want to make sure that whoever's licensing our work is going to advance the cause and not any other um, use of it. So we're we're very proud about making sure their work is used well. Awesome. We also got a question if you guys could share your portal. So we just dropped the portal link um, to ILCP's library in the Slack channel. Um, we can also drop that um, in Slack uh, or in the questions box, whoever asked that question. Um, yep, I just so did. So it should be there. Awesome. Perfect. And then um, we also dropped it into live chat. So check over there. You all have more questions from the audience? Definitely, definitely, uh, and keep them coming. These are great questions so far. Um, and actually, this one follows up from what you were just talking about, Colin. Um, what do people license the photos uh, for? What, what are they using them for? And um, are there any kind of uh, curious photo usage requests that you've received? So it's usually photo editors for publications like National Geographic or Smithsonian Magazine who are licensing from us um, because we do share a lot of the same photographers so they know where to look. Um, but also we get schools looking to use our images. We get, I mean, as Brooke was saying, we get a lot of people wanting free usage which is just not something that we do. I mean, we understand, like sometimes it's hard because they want to use the image to really like, for, for, for a good cause, you know? And they're like, I just don't have the budget. I mean, but part of our mission is we want to give these photographers and videographers um, payment for their incredible work, because um, this is their livelihood. Um, so we we try not to. I mean, every once in a while we'll get a free request, and if it's really good work or a really good organization needing it, we'll reach out to the photographer themselves, and then ask, "Are you comfortable with giving this for free?" And sometimes they'll say yes, sometimes they'll say no. Um, but I'm trying to think of a a strange one. Well, there was there was one that was. It was a story on oil for the oil spills, the BP oil spills. But it was, I looked at the, the, um, the publication, it's an online publication, I can't remember the name, um, but they seemed like they weren't too much of a believer of climate change or it was just 
nothing I would have ever wanted to license for. Um, so that's one of those where it just wouldn't work out, you know, um, for licensing. We'd have to reject that usage because it just wouldn't follow our guidelines for usage. So that was a very strange one that I found. Yeah. <laughs> and I um, just want to um, oh, jump yeah, cool. in with that and say, moving the cause forward, um, as Colin's saying, is definitely so important. And it, it looks different in different ways. It's not always like this is a nonprofit that's working, you know, on Arctic National Wildlife Refuge work. And so they're the ones using it. Often it is, but you know, conservation biology is a big one. They have covers. So that's like the scientific research. Some people um, use them for calendars and things like that to do fundraisers um, and all of that. And then I also just wanted to note with the um, not giving images away for free, the photographer owns the copyright, obviously. So if they decide like, this is a great project that I want to donate to, and this is the way I'm going to donate, that's totally up to them and they can do it. And that's great. But as the nonprofit that represents them in their images. That's not something they do. A great follow-up question here. Who determines the licensing fee? Do your users negotiate that price with you or do you have a fixed rate card? We have a fixed rate that has been around since I started. I'm not entirely sure if that was, um, if those prices were chosen with the photographer's input that's something I can look into and then um, give you guys the answer in the Slack channel. But for now, I'm, it's, it's fixed for now, but I'm not sure how they came up with it. I love this question from Anita. So first of all, she says, thank you for your presentation. What is the total number of images in your library? And can you speak a little bit about metadata and how that gets input into your system? So there is a little over 17,000 images in our image bank. Um, and metadata is super important. When the, when the photographers are sending in their submissions, we have requirements of them. And some of them do not follow it, some of them do. Um, <laughs> and they will send us images with, we need keywords. We don't need a ton of keywords. That's also my job. I will go through them and add any necessary keywords that I find important. But we need some keywords. We need a caption. We need um, the location. We need the time and um, the timestamp. Um, and we need um, the photographer credit line. Um, so that's not too much to ask the photographer to do. Um, usually they have a Lightroom set up that everything populates and it's it's all good. But um, it's, it's very important for us, especially for Brooke as the communications um, manager that she has access to those captions and keywords for her work and social media. But it's also important while I'm creating photo stories with Esri story maps, um, when I'm building a narrative with a different um, story with, from a photographer. And that way I won't have to ask the photographer, okay, like, give me a, a brief caption for this image that I'm gonna use. Like it's, I'm able to look in our image bank on Photo Shelter for these great captions that are already in there and use that in the story maps. Wow, very cool. A fun one from Jalal, how does someone become a fellow and or a contributing photographer? Brooke, do you need me or you? Oh, I can do it. So um, uh, we do have like a stand, so we have two levels of membership that you can join through. Um, one would be an emerging league. So that person is um, more up and coming, but I mean, still pretty well established. Typically our emerging leaguers have still won you know, pretty significant awards and I've been working for, I would say five to 10 years, depending on the person. Um, but that level is basically, you know, they're on a really great path. Um, they're not at full full membership yet, level yet, but with a couple years of mentorship, they would really, really get there. Um, and so through that program, we accept three a year. Um, and that is capped because we do provide a mentor with our fellows. Um, and so that app, application process opens every year in February, Colin? <laughs> in January, January. Yeah. January. Um, <laughs> and it's a form 
on our website and you fill out, you know, your artist statement, your a bunch of different information, and, and then you submit um, kind of like a best of gallery, and then that goes through a review process. And then the other option for applying is through our associate fellow level, and that's someone who's a bit more established in their career, been doing it for a little bit longer, um, and is not really in need of that mentorship to kind of just oomph up to the next level. Um, and it's the same, it's a very similar application process. It's a little, it's two steps rather than just one, but it's very similar. Um, and that opens every year. Is that one in February? No, that one's January. January, they both open in January. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a good one, uh, Kristen. Um, this could be for anybody, um, or maybe sounds like it's a follow up from Collins. A uh, couple questions go. If photographers are entering their own keywords, how do you ensure that you have consistency with things like spelling, capitalization, et cetera? Great question. Um, I have to look through everything. So I need to make sure that everything is cohesive for the submissions and that everything's cohesive for our image bank as a whole. So I will go through and I will make any spelling changes. I will add anything that they missed. Um, so that's, it's just me reviewing literally anything sent to me from the photographers. Do you give them any guidance ahead of time, yep. like a keyword list or, you know? Yes, mm -hmm. yep, yep, exactly. Very cool. But some are more, you know, apt to follow with than others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how do you give them like w the guidance or, or the documents? Like how do they, what do they look like? You know, it's in, that we have yeah. a, a image submission guideline sheet that is on the members only part of the website. So it's for the, it's up there for them whenever they want to find it. And if I'm reaching out, for images, because sometimes I will send a call for images for just general submissions for the image bank. Um, and that's when I will have that document attached to the email, spelling out everything they need, all the keywords and any caption information that they might need. We'd like to have species, scientific name of the species, whatnot. Um, so sometimes they don't really know all that information and I have to do a little bit of research um, with them, of course, as well, um, but that's part of my job. Cool. Yeah, what's next? Yeah, the, uh, keep the, the questions coming. There's one that's coming about, um, I think it's just about like permission, access, and how you guys manage, who can download, who can upload things like that what people can see publicly so we put image we put thing like let's say for example the internal galleries we had we made those only accessible accessible to the staff members so it has that little red eye um or that red symbol next to them and then the rest it's it's permissions essentially i mean you're you're able to see it publicly, but permissions are based on password. So we create passwords for any download permissions that might be needed for a client. Awesome. And often light boxes have been really useful. Um, if I'm working with a partner or with a board member or someone to develop something, I can ask Colin. Um, this is why I'm so grateful to have Colin on our team. Um, I can ask him like, hey, we're looking at doing a project on illegal wildlife trade or, you know, um, coastal wolves or whatever it might be. Um, can you just pull together some of our top imagery or like really stunning imagery or whatever we might have into a light box and then I can share it with that partner so that they can see it but they can't download it or things like that. It's a really great way for me, um, for us to use, to show the partner what we have without you know, I don't want to send them all the images or I guess I could put like a PDF together, but it just really saves us a lot of time on that front. Awesome. Great. Another question that, um, frankly, to be honest, this is my question, but uh, I'm very <laughs> curious about it. Uh, you mentioned, Brooke, I think you mentioned the naming systems um, and how when you saw different naming systems in, in Photoshelter that indicated different usage types. 
you just explain that more and maybe break it down for us so you can you know steal some of those ideas from you guys yeah um in the examples i showed the usage types are actually fairly similar but we did start something called the red sector response fund which was to honor a recent board member and so without going into too much detail basically we got money to fund really pressing conservation stories so for example um we funded a photographer this was in 2019 so we funded a photographer to cover the australian bushfires um and so that was his project that we funded so we had usages to the images or like rights to use some of the images for social media for the story maps that colin was suggesting or talking about and things like that but they were i mean it was his project that he was using and he was really trying to get the wild wild power i can't talk wild fires talked about sorry about that um and then if it's an ILCP expedition, it's a little confusing because it's just the way that we like run expeditions, but that is a lot of either like the Arctic Refuge one, or sometimes we'll have a partner come in and fund it. Um, we did all of the planning on it. And so we're gonna do media outreach, which means we have a little bit more, we're writing pitches to magazines and stuff to get this conservation issue out. So there's more usage terms in there and it just, the naming system, it's not even actually something that we really like talked about when we came up with it. Colin just started doing it and it was really helpful. I just was like, oh, now I understand. Um, it just, whatever is kind of first is like how it came about. So if it's the photographer's name first, that's how it came about. If it's the expedition name first, that was us coming about it first. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question, I think we're running out of time here, so keep them coming, uh, is how much of the, oh, I love this question, it's really inside. All right, how much of the usage rights info from these, from those agreements end up in the metadata? So, the question is how much of the usage rights that are written down in the metadata are in the agreements themselves well from the agreements like mm -hmm. how much of that gets translated into the metadata it sounds like uh not much of it um we always have the photographer's name slash ilcp on all of our images in the copyright section of the metadata um so we don't have a lot of it but we do make sure that for every single submission we spell out that photographer owns the rights the, the rights to their assets very cool a lot of the um the usage agreements are for like there's a difference i think colin there was a lot referring to if someone submitted images that weren't through like an ilcp project um that were just being submitted for licensing whereas a lot of the agreements um that kind of come through or from expeditions like if we had a partner funding it or something like that um and in that case we don't actually spend that much time putting them in the image because they have it in the agreement they already signed so when they get the images they are pretty clear on the usage yeah and when we when we send the images um it's nice that we have like a little text area when we're sending the image with quick send or um, whatnot, but we spell that out as well when we send an image um, for them to abide by such usage that we agreed upon. So it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that is perfect. Found it in. <laughs> <laughs> as it should be. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you both so much for being here. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you to all of you for your great questions and um, I'm, you know, it was just incredible to get an inside look at, at all of your amazing, amazing images, um, get to know some of your fellows' work, and um, to see how you organize all that amazing content. Make sure to join us again on October 9th. We're going to be talking about artificial intelligence and AI auto tagging. We're going to be talking about integrations and our new collaboration tool, Workspaces. Then again on October 15th with a conversation with Texas A&M. And of course, save the date for November 19th. You are not going to want to miss it. These two are in, right? You guys are in? Yeah, we'll be okay. there. <laughs> their calendars are marked. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll yeah. see you all again next time. Thank you so much, Brooke and Colin. That was great.
Thank you. Thank you. So fun. See ya.